So in this talk, we're going to talk about Kafka pipeline scale. We're going to break the Kafka speed limit. We're going to go beyond light speed, beyond ridiculous speed, all the way to ludicrous speed. Anybody here has a Tesla? So you know what ludicrous speed is. Anybody else look up this movie Spaceballs ludicrous speed on YouTube right after the talk? I think you like it. It's really funny. All right, so I want to start off with a feature of data. Data is really like cheese. If you wait long enough, it gets spoiled. Same thing happens to your data in your pipelines. If your client reading the data is down, if you don't get it back up online quick enough, some of your data will expire and start getting deleted. This means that you end up losing data. And what this really means is that this is a ticking time bomb. I want to tell you a true story that happened to us at Nielsen Marketing Cloud. September 24th, 2020, 5.55 PM. I get an emergency call from my boss. And he says, check Slack. I go to Slack, and I see this. Earlier today, the zookeeper crashed. We lost some of the brokers. There was data loss. Please add anybody who needs to be on this uh, channel quickly so we can resolve this issue. We had an outage. Kafka was down. The results were we had one day of downtime. We had data loss. We, had, we ended up spending five engineering working days across a few engineers just fixing this. Uh, we had a few unpleasant customer calls, and we, had, we ended up paying about $3,000 in reprocessing costs. <coughs> not really pleasant, not a great situation to be in. So in this talk, we're going to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of Kafka. We'll talk about the whole pipeline, not just Kafka. Kafka and the whole pipeline of reading the data and, store and doing something with it. We'll talk about a few things that could go wrong. And then we'll talk about some insights and tactics that we've used to alleviate some of these issues that you could take into your systems as well and implement. A few words about us. My name is Ofer Dubrovsky. I'm Director of Big Data Engineering at Nielsen. Uh, with me is the one and only Don Adler. Ido, raise your hand. Uh, who's a big data team lead. We love data pipelines. We love Kafka. We love serverless and Spark and anything to do with these things. A few things about Nielsen or specifically the group we're in, Nielsen Marketing Cloud. Uh, we build marketing audiences that are great uh, for use uh, for marketing purposes. An audience is basically a list of uh, device IDs and some label we could figure uh, out about, uh, about that. Think about it as a mailing list. I, if I have a mailing list of people who are interested in pizza, I can send them coupons uh, for pizza uh, if I run a pizzeria and I want to get them into the store. Same thing for marketers. So there's a list for lots of different things uh, that we found we can create. And marketers love this. They like to slice and dice this and use this for marketing purposes. On the technical side, we're cloud native. We uh, ingest and process a lot of data. Uh, we roughly uh, ingest about 60 terabytes of new data every day. And we uh, store in our data lake roughly 5 petabytes of data. Uh, we use a lot of serverless uh, uh, systems in our architecture, and we're heavy users of Spark. In terms of Kafka, uh, we process in total over all our Kafka clusters about 25 billion events per day. Uh, and this, this is roughly 300,000 events per second. And our peak ever we had about 5 million events per second. So that gives you roughly the crazy scale we're running at. Our Kafka cluster uh, is, or clusters are basically seven different clusters. Uh, we have about 40 topics. I'll say a few words about that soon. Uh, 9,000 partitions, 60 brokers or machines that run all of this. Uh, and just the Kafka cluster 
cost over half a million dollars a year. In addition, there's an additional cost of all the consumers reading that di data and doing something with it. In a nutshell, about Kafka, um, for people who are less familiar with Kafka, Kafka is basically a data pipeline. On one side, there are producers, they produce the data and send it to Kafka. On the other side, and these are the messages they send to Kafka, a message is just a piece of information they send to the pipeline. On the other side, there's the consumers that can read this data, and each consumer can read different data it, it's interested in and do something with it. Inside Kafka, data is divided into topics. So I may have a topic uh, about uh, specific things and a different topic that has different information in it. And the consumers can read the topic they're interested in. And then for technical reasons, that inside the topics, uh, it's divided into what's called partitions to make it easier to manage within the topic. So you can see these messages, different colors. There's uh, three partitions on top. And, and it's just, they just hold uh, messages. Each message has a number, so we can access a specific message if we want to, or read uh, a bunch of messages from 1,000 to 10,000 or something like that. And these, in Kafka terminology, are called offsets. Why an offset? Because we keep incrementing the number uh, in the partition. We really love Kafka for multiple reasons. Uh, it's optimized for high throughput, there's high reliability, uh, it separates the, whoever produces the data and whoever reads it, which is awesome. Uh, it allows reprocessing, there's all great things about it. So we love Kafka, we rely heavily on it. And when you look at our old system, the way we used to read data from Kafka was the following. We had Kafka with all the different topics. For each topic, we would start a Spark cluster that would just read in a streaming fashion from Kafka. So it would just read data um, and store it into our data lake, which is S3. The data, the cluster would work in six minute increments. So you can see the graph below. Uh, data keeps piling up and then the cluster would read. So the amount of data waiting drops and then it would read again and you get this uh, uh, sawtooth uh, looking graph. All right, so this was working really well. Uh, and to give you more details about the reality of how it really worked, I'm going to pass it on to Ido. Ido. Thank you, Ofer. Okay, so as Ofer mentioned, this system worked perfectly and uh, it did exactly what we needed. But let me tell you about reality. Reality is not like theory. Just because nobody complains doesn't mean all parachutes are perfect. So there are some issues with Kafka, which, by the way, we ran into all of them, and we're going to talk about it. Issue number one. I can see it. So issue number one. Um, speed limit. We, we sometimes want to consume faster than the, than, than the speed limit, but we cannot. Let's see why. So, topic, topic partitions. Uh, um, I need a white You're out. I need, I need push dash. Okay, let I me know. do this. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit dizzy. All right, guys. All right, so issue number one is the speed limit. You want me to do all of it, you know? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, okay, a okay. Bit dizzy. Yeah, sorry. So, issue number one is the speed limit. Sometimes we want to read data faster, but Kafka has a speed limit, which is basically the number of partitions. You cannot go and uh, assign more consumers than the number of partitions. So if I have 10 partitions and 10 consumers, and I want to read faster, I want to add more consumers so I can have more horsepower, I cannot go beyond that. And that's an issue because sometimes when I have a burst of data and I do want to read faster, I'm kind of stuck. That's not great. Issue number two is wasted money. Uh, if you look at data, data is very moody. It's not 
coming at a steady rate throughout the day. Some hours we have more data, some hours we have less data. And then if we have all these consumers waiting for data and suddenly there's less data to read, that's great, but we're just paying for those consumers and not really using them to the fullest. So that's a lot of wasted money. No need to explain why wasted money is an issue. There's even more wasted money uh, around that, and that's the uh, data skew. Data does not necessarily mean that it's divided well across the partitions. Sometimes it's divided not unevenly between the partitions. So some consumers could be working really hard, and some of them are working at a lower rate, which means, again, that we're wasting resources and CPU and paying for them when we don't really need to. Issue number four also is related to that speed limit, which is a slow recovery. When we have an outage, data starts piling up. Let's say we have half a day of an outage. Data piles up, and then we really want to read it quickly. And then again, we're limited by the speed limit, which is, again, a problem for us. So there's lots of things that are really annoying. We've had recoveries in our case that took five days, and this is completely nerve-wracking. You're sitting there <laughs> waiting for the data to reprocess. You know that time bomb of uh, data expiring is just around the corner. You might lose that data. And believe me, this is not something you want, a situation you want to be in. Here's an example of an outage we had. You can see this is the amount of messages waiting in Kafka. You see that uh, we, had a down, we had downtime, that data stopped arriving, in this case, into Kafka because of some of other data center was down. Uh, and then when they started that, uh, they fixed the problem of the data center, suddenly we got a torrent of data coming in, and the amount of data in Kafka shot up. So system was restored here, and reco the recovery basically started. Look how long it took us uh, to recover the data. And by the way, in this, uh, in this outage, we had some data loss because by the time we, we ended up recovering the data, some of it already expired was, and automatically got deleted. Uh, in this case, the outage was four hours, and the recovery took seven hours which is a really long time. Um, why is the recovery slow? So if you look at a topic, this is a topic and this is normal time and we have some messages waiting and we have all these consumers uh, reading uh, and everything is great. And then we had this outage and we suddenly drop lots of data into the pipeline and the consumers keep reading roughly at the, you know, the maximum pace they can. So it's going to take a long time. Uh, in one of our outages, we calculated that for every, and, and by the way, as the outage is over, we still keep getting more data coming in. So we need to read faster than the normal rate. So in one of our outages, we calculated that, um, that we read data uh, for every hour of data we read, we just recovered roughly half an hour of data. So if think about, imagine if you need to recover 12 hours of data, that's going to take you 24 hours just to recover everything. And if it's more than that, it's going to take a few days. All right, so we really wanted to scale the Kafka, the Kafka pipeline. We were looking to solutions. We were limited by the partitions, and we couldn't do this. One option is let's just add more consumer machines, but we can't do this. We're stuck with the partitions. We can't over, go over the partition limit. This is our light speed limit. The other option um, is to add more capable machines. So each machine could read more, but that's expensive, right? Because we're going to pay for more expensive machines. And when we don't really need this, it's going to be expensive. Switching them out becomes really complex and switching the consumers all the time. So that's not a great solution either. But we really wanted to find a, a solution for this. Um, and as I said, the max throughput is basically limited by how much each consumer could read by the number of consumers, and the limit is the number of partitions. This is our limit. All right. So, uh, and by the way, if we, the other solution which we see many people do is that they, um, they basically add, uh, they add more partitions as a steady state and just have lots of partitions. But this is not great either because that means that the partitions are basically Kafka saving data into files. And if we add more and more partitions, data will be divided into more and more files. During off hours when there's not a lot of data, we'll get lots of small files. Um, and as a result, 
the, the machines have to handle lots of files and open and close them, and this is not great for the, for the machines themselves either. And it's really hard to scale down once we add those partitions. All right. The other thing is that um, if we add... Uh, the other thing with the cost of uh, recovery, recovery also uh, costs us a lot of money. Because if we know we're going to read really slow, what do we need to do so we don't lose data? We need to add more storage and just store more time. If you recall my example, if it takes us 24 hours just to recover, we need to add a lot of storage and extend that expiration time so the data doesn't get deleted. And we need to pay for this all year long, even if we have one outage one, one time a year. So this is really expensive. In our case, um, just adding more storage costs us about $110,000 a year that we constantly pay just so we have enough data stored in the cluster in case we have those outages. All right, let's look at some of the inefficiencies. So uh, you've seen the slide. During these low hours, the cluster was basically idle. And this caused a lot of wasted uh, money. The other thing is when I talked, I talked about is bursts, when we did have those bursts, the cluster capacity was limited. So all of this in these areas, the cluster was really underpowered and uh, messages were piling up. So we ended up getting really long queues. And this was an issue. In terms of efficiency, we calculated the efficiency of the cluster. So we have those moments where there's lots of data and everything is humming to the top uh, capacity, uh, which was great. But we had a lot of hours where the cluster was overpowered uh, to the amount of data. So all this area basically is wasted processing. When we did the calculation, we figured the cluster efficiency was only at 30%, which is not really great. So we're paying 70% for resources we don't really need. So we decided we're going to go and re-architect the system. The goals were the following. We wanted a system that uh, could auto-scale. So when we have the burst, we, can, uh, we could scale it up. And when we didn't have the burst, it will scale down and we'll stop paying those costs. Uh, we wanted to be able to quickly process bursts. Again, auto-scaling would help significantly. And we wanted to achieve cost savings. Again, scaling up and down would help us do this significantly. The main question was how we were limited by the partitions. So the common sense approach is to add more consumers. We can't do this because of the partition limits. The other option uh, was to find a way to break the relationship between the consumers and the partitions. If we can find a way to have more than one consumer per partition, we can scale the system up when we needed to and scale it down when we didn't need the resources. But the question was, how do we do this? So the first thing that came to us was, how about we take, here's a partition, how, we, how about we take the partition and we divide the offsets ourselves. We send each consumer the offsets to read, uh, and each consumer would read just those offsets. It's really important to do, uh, separate the consumers so they don't read the same offsets, because then we'd, have, we'd be processing some of the data uh, twice and duplicating data, that's not great. So we need to make sure that we uh, separate the, or, or hand out the partitions exactly um, as needed, and we need to make sure each consumer really processes their uh, data so we don't lose data either. And we could do this as much as we want. We could separate, basically split the partitions and assign to different consumers. That would work really great, but this is a little complex. And when, we, uh, when there would be hours with less data, so here's an hour with lots of data, we divide to three consumers, and then maybe the next hour has less data, we now send it to one consumer and we uh, shut off these consumers we don't need. So this would work great, but this is complex. This means we need to manage partitions, we need to worry about processing and reprocessing and all that. So we were really looking for a better solution. And the idea that hit us is that we really want to go with isolated uh, consumers, in our case, clusters, and we want them to be independent, right? As I mentioned, we don't want them to read the same data twice. How do we do that? 
the idea that came to us was to use discrete, discrete time slots. If we assign a consumer and we tell it, you read from a particular hour, let's say from three to four, and at the next consumer, we just tell it, you read from four to five, then each one would go to Kafka, ask what are the offsets for three to four, get the offsets and read it. The other cluster would go and ask for other offsets, and they would never uh, basically step on each other's toes. So this could work. We don't need to manage anything. Each consumer works independently. We don't have to manage uh, sorry, um, uh, offsets or anything like this. This is really perfect. So if we look at an hour, you could see that each hour has different amount of, uh, of data coming in, right? Three to four has a little data. Four to five might have more data. Uh, each one of these is a task. And we would spin up Spark clusters and assign them the task of processing the data for each hour. Each one would get uh, the task to read, read the data, process it, and when it's done, it could just terminate. Really nice. The benefits are, first, we don't need to synchronize anything. Like I said, this is self a self-synchronizing system. The second is, each cluster, when it gets the task, it could work at max throughput, right? It doesn't need to read slowly because the data is dripping in. It could read at max throughput, and when it's done, it could just terminate. So if it's done earlier, it could terminate earlier, and we save all, this, all the money of, uh, of actually not, uh, not running the cluster. Let's look at it um, on the time domain. So here we have the hours and we have the data coming in uh, basically at each hour. And here's the one hour mark. So you could see that some of the tasks are take, when, when we have hours with the little data, the cluster completes before the hour is up and we can shut it off. Some hours may take longer than an hour. If we had an hour with a lot of data coming in, it could take more than an hour. But that's okay because now, because the clusters are independent, at the next hour, we can start the next cluster and run it in parallel, and that would work well. And with all those small hours, we terminate the cluster early and save on the cost. So this really works well. If we map this to a timeline, check out what happens we get all these gaps in the timeline. The gaps are savings. This was money we were paying before for the machines that were constantly running that we can now uh, stop paying. Let's look at the efficiency. In terms of efficiency, we're close to 100%, or actually nine, roughly 90% when the cluster is working at th uh, full throughput. And then we also have a short warm-up time in the beginning of just starting the cluster. We're praying for the startup time as well. So um, roughly we're at 75% efficiency. Uh, if we would be able to improve the warm-up time, we could drive this higher and higher and get close to 100%, which would be awesome. Uh, we have some ideas of how to improve the, uh, the warm-up time as well. So this is something in our, uh, basically in our work plan to do in the future. Uh, but we've saved so much money that it's not as urgent as it was before. If we compare this to the previous system and see how much more efficient it is, check this out. So before, if you recall this slide, the cluster efficiency was roughly 30% overall over the day. Now, when we basically process exactly what we need and terminate the cluster, this is really like a serverless system. We just use resources when needed. The cluster, the new system is about 60% cheaper. So we are saving on the Spark clusters roughly $240,000 a year just from doing this. Not only that, we got lots of great uh, more benefits from that, and I'll talk about them soon. Uh, I want to mention the mechanics of how we do this. We use Airflow. Airflow basically, uh, on the hour, starts up a Spark cluster, assigns it the hour it needs to, uh, to work on, three to four, for example. The cluster starts reading from Kafka and stores it, in the, does the transformations it needs, stores the data into our data lake, uh, and when it's done, it terminates. We also take advantage of uh, EMR auto-scaling, which means we can terminate idle uh, instances when they're done. So if we have a cluster reading and there's lots of machines there, and some of those partitions are smaller, as I mentioned with the data skew, it will terminate those instances and let the others continue, which is great, more cost savings. 
Um, in terms of the, of the flow over the day, so we start off a cluster, it runs. At the next hour, if we, if we need to start off another cluster, or we do need to start off another cluster, we kick off the next one. And the previous one may have terminated or may, be keep, may keep working, depending on how much data, and so on and so on. If you look at uh, Airflow, uh, basically we have a single DAG, uh, basically a graph that, uh, that we've built there that manages everything. And we can add pipelines by just adding a config of you know, which topic to read and what, uh, how the cluster looks. And we can add as many as we want just by doing a five minute config. So here you have an example, you see all these different pipelines running uh, in Airflow. And this is really easy once we've built this. Let's look at some of the results, which are really interesting to see. So first, here's a graph of the uh, move from the streaming micro batches to the new system. So on the left, um, you could see those micro batches every six minutes. On the right, we've moved to the new system. Everything now is one hour, uh, one hour basically processing a, a deltas. And, you, and so you can see how it looks. If you look at the cost before, on the left, we were running basically fixed clusters, paying the same amount of money every day, except maybe some, if we, uh, there's some uh, oddities there because we re-ran something or something like that, but roughly it's fixed cost per day. On the right, you can see the cost changes every day because if we have more data, the clusters run longer, we pay a bit long more. If we have less data, uh, we pay less. Uh, overall, we have 60% drop in cost, as I mentioned before. Uh, this, is a, this is a slide I really like. You can see here the bytes per hour that we get in our system, and here's the cost per hour. You can see how much this correlates really well and tracks. The, the cost is, tracks the amount of work we need to do, which is really awesome. We didn't have that before. Overall, as I said, we dropped from about $400,000 a year to $160,000 a year. That's $250,000, $240,000 in savings. Let's look at outage handling. I mentioned outage handling and how this is something you really want to make sure works well. Um, so here's an outage we had with the old system. You could see uh, rec the recovery start, and you could see this took us about seven hours. Here's a similar outage that we had with the new system. Uh, something broke in the delivery of the data, uh, and then it was uh, uh, repaired, and we had to process a lot of data. Here it took 40 minutes because the system basically automatically started five concurrent clusters and just processed everything really fast, uh, which is really, really awesome. It equates to about 85% faster recovery. So whereas before recovery was a big issue for us, now it's a no-brainer. Sometimes there's an outage at night. We wake up in the morning, we see, oh, there was an outage at 2 a.m. By 3, it was done. Oh, great. Let's go have coffee. This is awesome. Here's another burst example here. Uh, uh, aerospike, uh, sorry, um, airflow was down, so uh, data was piling up, but it couldn't start the clusters. And then when this was fixed, basically we had uh, over a day of data, and we had all the recovery took about 1.6 hours, which is amazingly, this is blazing fast. If you look at cluster utilization, uh, this is ganglia from Spark. You can see in red all the red stuff. Basically, the cluster is close to 90%, and you could see that all the machines are in red, meaning they're working very hard, which is exactly what we wanted. All right, so this solution is working in production uh, for over two years. It's, it's just wonderful, no problems at all. Uh, this gave us the appetite to start looking beyond that, and we said maybe we could do this within the cluster instead of firing up all these clusters. Uh, and to do this, we need to get back to our previous thought of basically managing the offsets, but we kind of said maybe it's not that difficult. So what happens if we do this? Can we get this uh, to work? So we started doing... Um, experiments with that. We can't just add consumers uh, and not manage the clusters. But if we start handing out the offsets, as I mentioned before, we could do this. So here's an experiment we've done uh, by basically running 
one machine against one partition and then slowly adding cores and seeing if the processing speed increases by the amount of cores that we've added. You can see that every doubling of the cores roughly reduces the processing time by half. So from going from one core to two, processing time of the amount of data we tested uh, went down by roughly half. When we doubled the amount of cores again from two to four, it went down roughly by half again. Um, and if you put this on a logarithmic graph, you can see a nice linear dropping line uh, with a formula of close to minus one slope, which is great. This really means that we have a fixed amount of time it takes to process that particular data. Uh, the process time is roughly the, um, that fixed time divided by the number of cores, which is awesome. Means every core we add, we scale up pretty linearly, which is amazing. So this is in the works. It's not in production yet. Uh, hope to tell you more about it maybe in a future talk. All right, so we got a fully, uh, by the way, and this would get us to a fully scalable system, the same we had as before, but now this would be with a single cluster, much nicer than having lots of them running. All right, I want to summarize. So what have we talked about? We've talked about uh, Kafka pipelines and some of the scaling difficulties. Uh, we've talked about the cost of not scaling up and down. We really want to be able to scale up and down, and there's cost to not doing this. Uh, we talked about how we went about optimizing the whole pipeline, not just Kafka. And some architectural insights you can take into your own systems. Um, in terms of some of the some of the insights, specific insights, streaming, as you've seen, is expensive because the machines constantly work. So this could get expensive. If you don't really need streaming, I would definitely consider batch. Obviously, if you just go to batch and run the machines all the time, that would not help. But if you get to a system that can scale up and down, that would uh, go a great uh, deal forward for you. The other thing is fixed clusters. Fixed clusters are really expensive during those off hours because we pay for the machines even if they're not doing much work. And then during those high loads when we really need them, they're too slow. We get these long queues piling up. Third thing is recovery. This is something critical. You don't want to leave out of your architecture as an afterthought to add later on. Recovery is painful. You want to design this into your system. When you design any system, you want to think of recovery and make sure the system is designed to handle this well. And last thing, to get all these, to solve all these issues, if you go for parallelism and isolate your uh, compute units, you get all these great things. You can easily scale, you can save all these costs, and you can deal with those loads when you do get them. All right, so with that, I'll conclude. If you want to reach us, here's where you can find us. And I'd be happy to open up to questions. Thank you very much.